All right. Okay, so um, one of the things that I'm interested in us exploring is, is there a way to take this app that has been developed, well, it's been part of the development of this. Um, we, he'll give you the background on all of that. But uh, I'd like you, as you're listening to this, to jot down notes. Uh, I have pencils if you want. Um, some way of kind of thinking about how this app might be used for the comprehensive plan. Kinds of information that people are gathering, what other applications they can use. So, you have, you have something you can take some notes in, you've got white paper up there, whatever, and then you'll, I'd like to, they probably could ask you questions during. Yes. And then at the end, I'd like to do a little brainstorm. So, what I'll do is, as you ask questions, I'll just repeat the question so it, it picks up in the microphone and the recording. But there's going to be some history here because I think there's some context. A good context for all of you to understand why you're here, why you're here at the mall, and what your role is as a as a as a student of Ball State and community outreach and assisting this comprehensive planning effort. Because it's it, it while it feels like a fresh and new thing, it is something that is very built into our DNA as a college and very much part of our tradition of what it means to be here as opposed to being at a different design school. So um, a little bit of context as to what you're about to see. This is a presentation that Scott and I gave in New York City at the National Planning Conference in, at the Graphic Center in 2017. Uh, it was part of a grant program. We were awarded $2,000 to investigate the, the possible crafting of, a, of an app that would facilitate community engagement and public participation, uh, specifically for, for small town and rural planning as well as uh, inner city neighborhood planning. Um, because at the time, we didn't see uh, we saw some different things starting to happen. Uh, a lot of things have happened since in terms of how community engagement has become more digital. And to be honest, y'all are already kind of doing it. Right? By, by having a, a, a meeting here and having the connection with Zoom, you already are doing it. You're already starting to become a pioneer, a digital pioneer in public participation. Further. So, so some context for that in terms of how where that went. Um, and I just need to figure out how to advance the slide while running it through Zoom. Um, so here we are. That was us three years ago. Uh, as I like to say, three years and 20 pounds ago. Um, looking back at giving, giving a, a New York audience some context for some of the community engagement we've done um, across the, the years. This photo here is, is Professor Egging, <laughs> a younger Professor Egging meeting and talking with a number of the Black Panther Party of Indianapolis. Uh, for a community engagement project to have in the bottom, 69, 70. Yeah, what that was is Methodist Hospital, the community Methodist Hospital was buying up the neighborhood around it. Right. And um, that primarily was an African American neighborhood. And of course, whenever you start displacing people and, and you create a great deal, you start creating civil unrest. Right. And so the studio uh, was part of the Mitigation, mediation, the hospital, and the neighborhood responds to work through some of those different people. But because Ball State students were there, Ball State faculty were there doing community engagement, we, they were able to bring in the voices of the Black Panther Party and the local community on time to move the project forward as, as opposed to uh, a, a different situation, a different outcome. So it's, it's, proven that, it's proven that when we're looking at issues of social justice and inclusion, uh, against uh, uh, issues of displacement and gentrification. The shred process and community engagement can bring those voices together. Well, so, I'm not sure. I'm talking about Tony. I'm talking about, can I talk about Tony? So, that picture on the right, you see the guy in the middle with glasses. That's Tony. Oh, there's more of those. There's more of those. Okay, but that project, that is interesting because that was a student proposal to put Market Square Arena above the road. That was a student project. And that actually later, that's how that happened. Really? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So that was the student. If you can look at that model, right. the market street going under it. That was the proposal. And that's um, the guy, Frank, yeah, and he later became a assistant director of Pod. And then um, Don Carey, who was the state architect. Was the right. So when Market Square Arena first came about as a project, they wanted to build it officially. And so the, 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 the 
effort with Mayor Luger and others to bring it downtown and have Market Square Inn be, be part of the downtown, have the pacers there, et cetera, was one of the first of its kind in the country for, for, for reinvesting sports facilities back into downtown. Well, Baltimore Camden Yards is known as the cathedral of, of ballparks in the downtown city. Market Square was actually uh, very, very ahead of its time in terms of bringing sports facilities back into downtown. Uh, you're, you're part of a tradition that goes back to 1969, the first, the first uh, sophomore studio uh, did a charrette in Mitchell, Indiana. So uh, even you know, it was the first graduating class, the very first, uh, uh, some of the first students there. So, so and Professor Truex has been involved since. Hamilton, 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 North Fort Wayne. Okay. So um, you're looking at a, a catalog of over four or five hundred projects. So, um, there. <laughs> oh, you got the jag wagon. <laughs> I told you not to call it that, Scott. Anyway. So, so this this is a young Professor Egging. This is a young Professor Costello. There is young Professor Truex inside of the Jaguar, <laughs> which he came up with the, in this the inside of the house covered in shag carpet. Shag carpet. So just to give you some support. Yeah. Yeah. They certainly could, right? Yeah. Those doors are way too full. And then, and Professor Costello speaking with local TV. This is Professor Munyar. That picture just took the whole class out of No, they just, they want to know what you look like. And there, there, there you are, inside the third way. Okay. So, so the mobile, the idea of a mobile studio or a, a mobile experience, uh, take, taking taking a shred process out on the road, uh, something that takes us back. And uh, using the technology of the time, so using the media at the time, creating newspaper tabs or newspaper inserts in which the drawings could be photographed and then reproduced quickly and then sent to every citizen a, a very important way of bringing, bringing in a lot of public opinion, public participation, and, and, and public, uh, public comment into the process. So, so uh, Ball State Community-Based Projects Program through TAP built up a reputation throughout the country for this type of public participation that used newspaper media in this particular fashion. Three-day workshop that included all the drawings and then producing the newspaper. Yeah, and they look very much like this. So primarily black and white. So primarily uh, ink on trace, uh, and and then photographed and then uh, prepared for that type of uh, re reproduction. So not a lot of color back then, but uh, uh, you probably are very familiar with these drawing techniques because we still teach them to you today uh, in the first year program and second year program. So. Um, uh, many of those same drawing types are still very much part of our culture too. Um, and then the impact of some of the neighborhoods that were started were that Scott sitting there on the porch, um, another great young picture of Scott, um, but leading directly to the rehab of, of several homes and neighborhoods, rescuing uh, uh, whole neighborhoods from from uh, from obliteration, ruin, developer-driven uh, situations, or highways, or things like that. Uh, the Shrek process and the community relations process has, has empowered several communities across across the state of Indiana and beyond uh, to help fight different issues that often have threatened uh, the community and character and culture of, of neighborhoods. Okay. So the house on the left, of course, that's the read to read done. But at the public meeting, the consensus of the neighborhood was all the men wanted to save the house and all the women wanted to throw it out. It turned out that it was a local brothel, and all of the, when we went in to tour it, it had mattresses and room numbers on all the rooms. So for some reason, it wasn't an objection by the men, but it was. So we compromised, and we attempted, but we couldn't get more possible. We chose a land use that it wasn't. Other impacts in Muncie, the Muncie downtown that you know today was not what was there before. <laughs> so a uh, brief, brief overview that Victor Gruen, the famous uh, Austrian architect and urbanist, made a proposal for pedestrianizing Walnut Street. That proposal passed. There were several options that it would include even the mauling of our downtown. There's, there were four options given. They're in our archives. It's very interesting that Walnut Street almost became the Muncie. 
So I can't imagine that we would be dealing with it. We would probably have to have a meeting here today if, if our downtown had been turned into a mall. At any rate, um, the pedestrian mall proposal was passed. It took over two years of construction. And during that two years, the business owners could not survive. They just could not continue to do business because construction took so long. Competition started to move and, and real estate and land started to move north. The creation of the Muncie Mall as a competitor to downtown happened. The Gallier started to become known as a strip. And so local businesses who had done business in downtown for 50 plus years started moving north. And then because of that, downtown started to die. So, uh, so an interesting notion, I think putting the context of what we're dealing with right now, we are dealing with the issue of pedestrianizing streets. We are dealing with the issue of extending space outside because it's good for business in a COVID atmosphere when, when social distancing is going. The thing is, so many American cities have been here before. There were over 300 pedestrian malls built across the country, less than 20 survived. And so if you want to see one, go to Kalamazoo or to Richmond, Indiana. Uh, Richmond, Indiana is the closest one. They have, still have one or two blocks left of their original pedestrian mall. The pedestrian mall was a fad, if you will, uh, centered around bringing cars into your downtown, having people park at noticeable spots, either structure parking or service parking, and then being able to walk through a, a shopping experience. Very typical in Europe, still very typical in Britain, uh, Australia, New Zealand, uh, and still very popular, but it just it kind of fell flat in some of our Midwestern cities because of the severity of our climate, the severity of our summer, and the severity of our winter. At any rate, uh, downtown starts to die, and so um, uh, Professor Truex and Professor Costello take over the Maid Right Bakery, which had, which had that uh, aluminum siding. Yeah. Well, that was that kind of plastic. Okay. That plastic sheeting over it. Yeah. Okay. And as you started to remove it, uh, revealed this that beautiful palladium window. <laughs> so um, it was the one of the first facade rehabs, the interior rehabs on Walnut Street for, for that time. So. That's the first Muncie Urban Design Studio. 40 years from when we opened the year back. Exactly, 40 years. Or is it 70 years? 80, 20, 20, 20 years. No, that, that would be 1980, yes. Yeah. Uh, that's President Bell. Yep. Um, that's Mayor uh, Alan Wilson. They took us to New York. So that, and that was, that, that, Shot was taken on the pedestrian mall on the yeah. Street. You know this address well because it is Viramaze today. Viramaze is now a restaurant. Yes, Andy. Um, I don't know if you know about this, but you mentioned that Richmond, Indiana still has kind of yes. part left of this outdoor work. Yeah, yeah, they have two blocks left up there pedestrian mall. Really? Yeah. In the downtown. Yeah, yeah. So it's worth visiting because it, it, it is, uh, today, in today's context, we're revisiting the idea of the pedestrian mall as a way of street. So you are revisiting it. I haven't been to Richmond in a while, but, but uh, <laughs> yeah, that is lengthy construction can kill it. Yeah. So that is that is part of the issue. So, so that well. building to the right was a hardware store. Yes. To the window, and then that those two are what is Jeremy today. Right. You walk into Jeremy on Long Street, but you walk into our studio and there's that little wall, little reception area. Then you go through the wall into what was the hardware store, and that that hardware store there is, is closing as we're opening. And then, and your second address was where Casa del Sol was. Okay. That was your second address okay. because the Monthly Urban Design Studio moved a couple of times. Yeah, as it as it did, it would rehab the building and then move on. So, so Ball State has had a hand in terms of, of revitalizing and rescuing. Uh, Actually, during that two years we were there. We were offered almost all of the buildings downtown to Ball State to take yeah. over. Yeah. And the particular vice president at the time kept refusing. We were trying to do what the Savannah College of Arts and Design did, which was it totally moved its campus to design downtown and totally revitalized it, uh, Savannah. So, for the benefit of the recording, Scott is just has, has, uh, has recounted that. that Opportunities for for Bolster to take over multiple downtown buildings, similar to what Savannah College of Art and Design has done, uh, was was refused at the time. So this continuous counting down relationship is something that uh, has been revised and revised from president to president uh, 
capitalist agenda has always been trying to push the envelope. And again, we're here at the mall because of that similar type of thinking, that similar type of spirit of, of embedding ourselves into the community and creating accessible places for the community to interact with the efforts as opposed to uh, being, being behind uh, an academic wall. So charrettes were the typical norm for a lot of this. Uh, charrettes with trace paper, charrettes with markers, uh, charrettes with, with uh, interviews, with pinups, with uh, public meetings, uh, the typical way of, of interacting with the public, uh, getting those drawings in front of people, uh, helping them participate in, in the vision, and, and helping them realize their vision uh, was the typical format for many, many years. And the results are, are the must-see that, well, the, <laughs> 37 years later, this is three years ago, <laughs> the, the, the streetscape and the activities that we, we come to know before COVID, uh, uh, the, the cultural life of must that we, that we have today. So. Uh, Canon Commons, outdoor seating, outdoor dining, food trucks, um, Vera Mays, uh, Arts Walk are all part of that longer legacy of that 40 year effort to revitalize uh, our downtown. Um, Indianapolis, long, long uh, standing tradition in Indianapolis. Uh, Scott was part of starting the Captain Indianapolis Center on Maryland Street and, uh, and bringing Ball State students and uh, uh, faculty into the Indianapolis Regional Center 2020 plan. Which is now complete, obviously, that it's 2020. Uh, but those those workshops, charrettes, and meetings started in, in the summer of 2000 with a storefront studio on Maryland uh, Street, right next to Rock Bottom Brewery. Which I can tell you, doing several design charrettes at, in that storefront, being next to a brewery can be extremely dangerous. Uh, but but at any rate, uh, we spent many many happy weekends uh, down there uh, uh, doing charrettes and workshops and bringing in studio projects. From across the discipline to do studio projects in Indianapolis that were products of the, the planning ideas. So, so something would come up during the planning process, and then an architecture studio would pick up the idea and do a cemented project around it. So that coordination between the departments uh, is, is another kind of key takeaway from that. But a great uh, a great generation of students and faculty uh, doing Indianapolis-based projects for that. Back to Muncie, the village was dying at a certain time, and Scott and students and faculty, we, we did a show that there, uh, when, the, when the village in particular was struggling. Uh, uh, this, this is a storefront uh, right on University Avenue, right where the village promenade is today. And there was a hard rock <laughs> punk venue in the back. So when we were doing this charrette, there was, there was like six punk bands going into the night and they would shout over each other. Some great memories there, but uh, Neil. Yeah, there's Neil. So he's he's our he's teaches our second year now. Uh Sean Northup teaches transportation. He did that workshop for us. Yeah, so 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 a lot of our alumni go on to uh, uh to great leadership, uh great leadership <laughs> uh roles. But here we are, you know, looking at a figure ground, tracing over the figure ground, that's how we get started. Um, and so these these large project pinups with lots of, of bullet points and top ten lists and, and trace maps and public meetings, um, something that I think I think you're you're becoming very familiar. Um, the thing, the one thing that's I think distinguishable about this time, this period of time, was the amount of public participation was 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 really really inspiring. So hundreds of people would show up to these meetings because they cared so deeply about the community issues that they were facing. Uh, would, would their community survive? Would would would, would their neighborhood survive? Uh, what what sort of transportation issues can we be looking? What, what would a bypass do for our community? What would it do to our community? And so these workshops were very instrumental in educating the public uh, to, to help look at uh, the, the decisions that they were facing as a community and, and show uh, some, of, some of the possible ramifications. But Jack, you talk about yeah. the uh, the But it became the norm to have hundreds of people show up. I did a workshop in Lingolstown, Pennsylvania. There were, the charrette team was four people. We had 200 people show up the first night uh, because they were so angry about one issue. And so uh, the workshop was built around that, that concern. And so it, it led to some great consensus. So that's me 20 pounds ago. That's Professor Blaylock, director of the, of the MUD program. So sketching away, drawing away. Uh, we started really kind of get around a charrette style of drawing, which we offer uh, in elective in the spring. We want to get more into that graphic method, but representing the people who live there, as opposed to the people who don't live there, very important when you consider the graphics. 
and who, who you represent and how you represent it. Uh, starting to bring in some of the cultural aspects of West Washington, or near West Side of Indianapolis, a fantastic uh, neighborhood of, of, of Latin American immigrants, Mexican immigrants, so starting to celebrate that cultural heritage. Fletcher Place with a great collection of Victorian houses, starting to build up uh, infill, signage, archers, and things like that. Little projects that come out of a charrette uh, that can really start to turn a community around. Uh, this is in Griffith, Indiana. The top image is from Griffith. So Griffith is a, is a Lake County uh, suburb of Gary that has completely turned itself around in the last 10 years. Uh, extremely active downtown, new brewery, fantastic vintage bowling alley. Uh, really, really a great success story. But I can tell you that was the last time I was thumped. All of you in planning are going to be thumped at some point. What is thumping? Thumping, as Daniel will demonstrate, Something is when a citizen comes up to you and puts their two fingers into your right here. Now you listen to me. <laughs> okay. But when a citizen becomes so so engaged that they feel that their voice needs to be heard, they will get in your face and thump you. Okay. So I was thumped for that reason because it showed upper floor housing. And and this and this citizenry, this particular this particular group of citizens were so concerned about the impact of upper floor house and what it would do to their property values that they closed anything above one story. Well, as you know, if you, if you don't build for density, you, you end up building for something else, right? You end up with a very less dense context and, and have less livability and less vitality in the street and less vitality in business climates and less vitality in your real estate. But to them, in that particular moment, upper floor housing meant other things. And so the shred was instrumental in helping to educate and share the public that, it, that in fact, uh, upper floor situations were good for the community, not bad. And you deal with classism, racism, and fear, sometimes in a very visceral way, to the point where people get in your face. And you just need to be ready for that. You need to be ready for that and understand that that you are there as an ambassador, as, as part of the political process, and um, as a community. And so you work your way to bring those people in. Okay. But that was the last time I was done. But there are new challenges. Just in your lifetime, we went, just in your lifetime, we went from this to this. All right? So Pope John Paul, his funeral parade, you can see one cell phone to the introduction of Pope Francis, everyone has a phone. Everyone has a smartphone. Just in that short period of time, your world has changed. In that short period of time as well, uh, you weren't, most of you weren't born yet in 1993, but all of those devices were something that somebody like us would be using. And it would cost, um, let's say, all of that ended up together about $10,000. Okay, all those devices, right? Have all been replaced by one device. All of it, okay, right? All of that has been replaced by women. So, so while the world has gotten more complex, it, in one way it's gotten simple. <laughs> so maybe, right? So where where are we? In it? So that that's that's a it's an important image, an important one. It uh, it it certainly puts us in context in terms of where we are uh, in communication. Where is our public space going? How do we interact with public? Uh, are we are we getting together or are we at This image was taken um, in the beginning of the Pokemon Go trip, the first summer of Pokemon Go, when hundreds of people were out on American city streets exploring their communities because the Pokemon Go game is built on the Google Places directory. The Google Places directory is built on every historical building, landmark, cemetery, church, marker, everything. So the game is populated by that. So therefore, folks were re-experiencing their landscape in a totally new way, discovering things about the community that they didn't over there because the game brought them there. And so this mural, I, I, I need to find the credit for it, but was painted <laughs> in honor of the phenomenon that Pokemon Go gave us, which was a new way of interacting with our built environment. 
the shred process needs to adapt to them. It, it needs to introduce them. But the shred process, as uh, Bill Leonard has, has outlined, starts with the public meeting, goes through alternative concepts that the shred team develops, goes through another public meeting, devises the, the preferred plans, goes into another open house review, goes into the final uh, plan development, and then uh, with a public meeting of the confirmation. And it typically, uh, according to Bill Leonard and the Shred Institute, which now is based at Michigan State University, that takes at least 10 days. That can be done in one setting, but it take 10 days. It probably takes us a full semester to do this. And, that, and so I think the timeline's a little bit different, but that these feed, we call these feedback loops, where your work becomes reviewed by the public so that you have confirmation, confirmation, confirmation until you reach the finalized plan. Technology has changed. We still love to use the letter set dots to vote on things, but as we can see, the dots can fail. <laughs> okay? So we have digital ways of getting this public participation, getting this data together. <laughs> the dots, yeah, the dots all fell off. Right, right. Yeah, and this is photograph by one of our alumni, Megan Tuttle, who now works in Burlington. But a lot of our work that does still involve a lot of people standing on our maps and pointing at things. And so we've been fortunate to continue that. That format of interacting with the public, however, however, uh, public participation has decreased. You're talking hundreds of people in the 80s and 90s, down to maybe you might need to buy. So, and then with, you add COVID to that, you, you find yourself in a position of using every available technology that you can to try to generate public participation. Sticky notes, I mean, you, you, you've heard and seen workshops and lots of sticky notes, design thinking workshops, things like that. What are What is the digital equivalent of sticky notes? Um, what would you say is the kind of cause of the decrease of the public? The cause of decrease of public participation in the last few years? Um, yeah, I would say it's, it's the, free, the, the free exchange of information on Facebook and others has, has uh, uh, both made all of that thinking accessible, but also inaccessible. <laughs> People feel that they can voice their opinion anywhere. They don't necessarily need to bring it to a public forum. So that I think has changed our dis public discourse. We as planners, though, you you, you have to you have to cast the net wider and get try to get more voices and bring it together using the <coughs> tools that you have that are beyond the traditional public use. So Community Remarks is a company that is now offering digital public participation as a paid consulting service. Okay, City of Edmonton will hire this firm to come in and say, please do digital public participation for our comprehensive plan. And they will pay a fee for it. If you are interested as a, as a sub-genre, sub-discipline, future as a planner, you might find yourself working for a consulting firm like this, doing public participation. This might be your niche that you, that you find on the consulting side, right? Working as a consultant to a municipality. So these things are happening, and uh, and you build a web page based on a map. Uh, typically, it's it's a Google map, or it might be uh, another map division. And uh, people drop little markers and they drop little comments, and and those are recorded. Other folks are starting to do community change and activism using really dumb technology. Walt Raleigh built a series of signs with QR codes. That simply linked to Google Maps. It was so simple. You pick any point on a Google map, you can create a unique URL for that. You link it to a QR code, you print a sign, and you can change your whole town, you change your whole community, the way you navigate through that whole community. And so sometimes it's the dumbest technology that actually can work and turn a place around. And this has been copied all over the world. But it started with Walt Raleigh, uh, North Carolina. Neighborland, San Francisco based firm, um, started to build apps around community issues, community impacts. Uh, so that, that was 
one of the more interesting user interface, graphically rich, graphically elegant uh, apps around specific community issues in the San Francisco Bay Area. So they, they, they built a series of apps um, uh, as an agency and started to customize it around specific San Francisco issues. Uh, one of the artists that participated in Neva Land was, I believe her name is Candy Olson. Um, she was the inventor of Before I Die, the blackboards that were installed for the kids before I die. Uh, 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 she also developed. Uh, uh, yes, so exactly. Yeah. Walking, uh, right. And yes, and she also developed a sticker called I Wish This Was. People could write anything they wanted on the sticker and place it on buildings or place it on the lots. I wish this was. And so it was another way to engage in public participation at some kind of very visceral and emotional level. So, um, Mind Mixer is another platform that is being used by uh, college master plans. Uh, so that's another platform. Uh, so they, they, they build a large constituency master plan style of, of community engagement and it's very similar very similar to the platform that you probably took did you all take the survey from smith group regarding the ball state master plan did you all take the survey you all should take the survey as students uh, these types of mapping platforms where the public is invited to put points on a map and create comments around those points is becoming now a pretty standard thing for large master plans yeah Work on like all different types of devices. Yes. So on the one you can actually type it through the map. I have the same problem. So <laughs> yeah. I was just it works better on the You're right. It does have problems with the mobile. Yeah. Well, my mixer, we use my mixer for the last ball statement from 2016. Calvin College is the example where for 2016. And uh, but I think I think you're right that the newer one does not work as well as that's the problem. That's the problem, addressable problem. Fix 311, there are other apps where cities are buying into these apps that, that I, I want you to fix my pothole right now. And so this is a way of creating a mapping style app to help identify fixed problem infrastructure. So that's another <laughs> possibility for an app uh, to, to help identify problems. But that's another example. Um, Poll Everywhere was another one. <laughs> Just you could create facilitate polls and you could push it towards different different constituencies. Morfolio was developing a uh, a, a finger sleeve that would go over the phone and read your heart rate as you walk through a screen. <laughs> and so starting to get emotional, live, biometric things. <laughs> so taking it to that next level of data. So using the phone's camera, you can actually use some of the pulse of the wearing out Apple Watch it already does. But the, at any rate, um, starting to think about what the phone already has and building simple attachments to the phone to actually help, help the phone gather more data. The crowd cloud was another one. The crowd in the cloud, citizen participation project, science of data gathering. This was a great PBS series that happened around 2017. And then other situations where um, just by mining geotags or by mining hashtags, you can start to figure out what parts of the city will be photographed more than others, and then start to build heat maps around them. A lot of that data is readily available. Okay, you can you can open up the Strava app today and see where all of the Strava cyclists and runners are running from. You can see, you can map that together and find out very quickly what are the best roads, what are the best parts. All of that is already available uh, in, in, across different apps and build, to, the ability to generate heat maps from that. Here's Chicago. So these are the most photographed parts of Chicago according to Instagram or according to that is time. Yeah, uh, exactly. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. So that's happening. Those are things that you can start to, to, to harvest quickly. So. The question we wanted to ask was, could we build an app that could facilitate our community engagement work? With all of that history and context, all that background, that 40 years of work, could we build an app that could facilitate that? So I started to sketch out a user interface that was based on a digital sticky note. Now, anybody who used concept board in the last year recalls 
stickiness, right? Neuro concept where it's all based on the stickiness. So very interesting that, <laughs> that everything begins with this notion of the stickiness. So that's how, I don't know anything about computers, I don't know anything about building apps, but I know how to think about a user interface and how one might start to use an app. I can hand this to a software engineer or a software architect, they called software architect now, to build a user interface. So that became interesting for me as a, as a designer to think about how can we build an app based on digital sticky notes and how can we put those digital sticky notes on a map and start to uh, put things together. How can we group community issues around hashtags that people are tweeting about and start to harvest those things and start to put those on the map? How could we create a shred drawing and have people react to it? Do you, do you agree or disagree with this idea? And start to get pulling uh, around that. How can we how can we group people together? Here are a few people working on this idea. Here's Angela, she's working on recycling in this neighborhood. You should meet her. Cool, right? That, that starts to bring people together around issues that they care about. So, so could the app start to bring that together? Neighborland was starting to do that already. We want 50 mouse feet with it around schools at least bring up, drop off and pick up times in Mountain View. Me too. And then they would start pull around it. But then these people could meet. They could start to interact and meet right in the middle. That was exciting because that kind of neighborhood activism is what gets things done quickly. And so uh, and so these 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 started to re re um, really remind me of the top ten list that we write on posters. So the whole graph looks something like that. The idea that folks could photograph their community, give thumbs up or thumbs down, okay? Take pictures of their community and say, these are things we care about, these are things that need to be fixed. That we could start to group those around a map. That we could start to uh, create positive and negative groupings around those things, whether it be photos or issues. And then start to create feedback loops, analyze the results, and then disseminate them. And this is all before Zoom. So this is all before COVID and Zoom. So this type of digital public participation, taking some of our older technology of photography and mapping and trying to combine it together in an app. So that was the question we wanted to ask. Could we put that together? So we built some beta testing. Uh, Kyle Parker, who works for Ball State as a software engineer built an app called Traveler. The original point of Traveler was to facilitate field trips. That's it, was to facilitate field, field trips. And what, what we tried it with our Chicago field trip and, um, and some of our other platforms and it became a pretty big app for a few years. And so I gotta take you through now to the demo walk through. I think I have to reactivate my screen sharing. So we built a beta test around the site for the Chicago field trip. We wrote all the text. <laughs> we created buttons around each destination around each day that would click into a live version of the map based on Google Maps. We created place marks with interest points, and then students could take pictures and be loaded into it. They could make comments, and that would be loaded into it. So that was the beta test. It was. It took us quite some time, and it's gotten a little over a year to test this uh, and try it out. But it was interesting to marry our existing photographs, existing history links to other things and then students could add more photos to the place and add comments to the place so that was our first testing first way of sort of building the app now that interacted with google maps with the camera on the phone and then text uh, interaction so this is that one minute demo <laughs> and then all of that all these comments would then feed into the app so then you could come back to it and, sit and see all the reactions to these places that the Chicago field trip started to look at. The next site would, would be the uh, Illinois Institute of Technology. 
And so we created place marks around interest points that we, that we normally would talk about. And then, um, and then students could then uh, add more things into the app. What did we find? Well, what we found was, what we found was interesting. <laughs> right, Scott? Um, first, the first day in Chicago, the first day of the Chicago field trip was interesting because, well, by the time we got there, right, three and a half hours on a bus, all of the students' phones were drained of their batteries. Because they were watching movies the whole time. Number one. Number two, they didn't want to remove their data. So they didn't want to use their data plan to interact with the app. So those were two things that we found out on the ground the first day. So those were two things that we needed to know, right? When you're, when you're building an app, these are things you need to know. So battery and damage were, were issue points. Now, all of a sudden, you have unlimited data, right? Am I right? Yeah, uh, probably, probably. Okay. So that's not an issue anymore. But, but those findings were extremely helpful. And so while the app did not take off, my town did not have life, if you will. Know, it kind of stopped because the competition that was out there was already more efficient in how it monetized the software for a subscription. Or it was competitive. Community remarks. There's another one called Map Social. There's another one called Place Vision. Those are things we should write down. Okay, those are the competitors, if you will. Those are the people who are already building apps that were doing this type of community mapping. And to our luck, Scott and I met every single one of these people on the convention floor in New York City. We had a booth, they had a booth, we, and we found out we were all doing the same. All right. In research, that's okay. That's full of finding. <laughs> it's okay. We found that other people were doing it, so we did not proceed with the building of the app or the commercialization of the app. But if we had found out that other people weren't doing it and saw an opportunity to create capital, we would have taken this further, right? And all states would have released it to the public. What Kyle did is he took this portion of the app that he built. And he put it back into an app called Traveler. Traveler was, was built back in 2014, 2013, 2014, was released onto the Google Play Store and the App Store. It became one of the top 10 travel apps in the world. So he took this part of the data, this part of the structure of the app, built it back into Traveler. So for a period of time, if, if you were attending Arts Walk in Muncie, you could, you could open up Traveler and it would guide you to all of the venues for our stuff that night. Here's the point. The app is already built. The question is, can you take what Kyle has already built in terms of this and in terms of what he has for Muncie and, and start to create something for this outcome? Where you can have people participating with their mobile phones, inputting data, Photos and comments, where they live, using their phone. Could you develop an interface that could be used first, given what's already there? That is the central question of today. Thank you very much. The thing is, we've got this, this framework sort of built, and so adapting it for potentially any observations or thoughts. I put Jake next to you. Hi, Jake. Hi, Jake. Well, I think the first question would probably be like, that's something like we'd easily be able to use, but that's not the generation that we're going to be meeting with. So how user friendly would it be to that generation and how savvy are they with apps? So when you say you're not meeting with that generation, what do you mean? I mean, a lot of the people that we'll be meeting with will be, you know, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and up. So, so maybe we need to be meeting with them. Right. 
But or maybe the app would have it. Within, that's not going to be the majority of the homeowners within the area. Okay, well, there's a couple of things. You, you brought up some really interesting thoughts. One is, what is the mark? What, are, what is the user group that might use an app like this? And I think the point you're making is reinforcing the need for an app because the people that may not typically attend meetings you're indicating might be that user group. Now, you said homeowner, which is curious to me that we would have any idea of distinguishing between whether you are a homeowner or not in terms of input. Because we really want a whole range of input, right? Not just homeowners. And stuff. So, two good points. Um, trying to engage the younger crowd through an app and like be very confident. I mean, I don't know if this is something you could add, but even it just not being like a source of information, somehow creating like a game, maybe that's something simple on it that people would want to do. Because I could see people talking about an app about money that's actually a game. Or could you like make a button and also have access to the information and pointing stuff? But like, okay. yeah, and I mean, a scavenger, I mean, especially like Ball State students, some students don't leave yeah. campus until like their junior year. So, I mean, if you made like some type of scavenger hunt or something, and then yeah. really got people involved in the community, and then you probably get more feedback after that. Well. Like Pokemon Go, but for Marcia. Yeah. Okay. So, great example. During that first summer of Pokemon Go, there was an urban planning student named Sam Weiser, who now works for American Structure Club, who was volunteering at the Mitzi Animal Shelter. Oh, yeah. And she discovered. The animal shelter was a spot on the game. And posted a Facebook message that come out and walk dogs and you'll get lots of points. Okay. It made national news because she married the idea of points in the game to a community news. It made national news. Or the ball state for the funny stupid dip. Okay. So this notion of gamifying something is very, very, very good. Very good idea. Ron? I mean, I'm vulnerable. Uh, even with something that kind of is not, not even like physically incentivized to be in any way, but like just a ranking system and then something like, for instance, like uh, local guides, which is like a thing that Google runs for people to like give impact on information or uh, feedback and like, like updated information for a lot of their um, sources and stuff, so, like the Times and Express on it. If you like update that or like add pictures of an area that you don't have, or like send them like literally any information that adds to the understanding of the place, they give you more points and you like get different ranks of like your local guy. To add on to that too, we could do like lo local businesses like menus and stuff too, and that would bring people to those places. And that's like, exactly what I can because Google yeah. doesn't put local menus on there a lot, it's well, mostly also, chains. There's a lot of local businesses around here that actually do bring up the conversation about what they want to see in Muncie and a lot of um, figures that are really important. And so if we did establish what kind of places these people come to and then others are interested in these local businesses to go visit, that's like we could target that kind of crowd. Okay, good. Daniel? It's kind of along the line if you made an app like this. You I feel like you you just want to have like maybe the home screen or like a little notification, you know, notify your phone saying, "Hey, did you know there's the Monty Farmers Market Saturday 8 a.m. Yeah. It's kind of advertise these like, event, these local events happening in the city. You know, it's literally for like a notification that will pop up. There's an app. Well, I didn't know. There you go. It's called local, and I love it. I use it every single time I go to any city. Really? I didn't even know that. That's I feel like adding that would be. Yeah. Is it a Google app? Um, I think it's for Facebook. Does Facebook app? Okay. So yes, all right. So mm -hmm. Facebook has its own places directory, mm -hmm. uh, which you know when you check into the place, that's that's a separate directory. But but uh, it's called a proximity mm -hmm. proximity ranking. So when you get so close to something, probably. you get an alert that says, "Hey, you're close to this." Mm -hmm. That's actually what we built into my time. Hey, you're close to this. You should look at this. 
And it didn't work because 20 of them would go off and their phones would start blowing up. But it does work in a larger uh, neighborhood or a larger district. Yeah. Where you put, uh, you take a point in the Google Places directory or the Facebook, whatever directory, and it creates an alert that sends it to the phone. Hey, you're close to this. You should check this out. Mm -hmm. So that is very easily doable depending on which platform you have. I say which platform because Google has a platform, Facebook has a platform, Apple has a platform, and they have their own maps, mm -hmm. right? And they have their own places directly. Yeah, the local app, it's literally called yes. local, but okay. it's any app or any event that is posted by like a So I think a couple of things that I would pull back on. One, you've identified this idea of how do we get some particular user groups that wouldn't be traditional meeting attenders. So you identified nothing against waitresses or waiters, but sometimes there's downtime between when you order and when your food arrives. And so you'll in, when you talk about some of these restaurants, it may be possible to create an interaction that would allow you, there was a restaurant over by Meyer that used to have something like a trivia thing or something you would do while you waited for so your food. And, uh, James used to have online trivia games where you would play nationwide via satellite and call. Yeah, you take some of it. But the, I think that's an interesting user group is, I mean, you think about, it would be pretty easy for us to print those table tents or whatever, those like things that you put on a table that might have information that could have a QR code and you could, you could while you're sitting there, and it could be a way for you to say, earn, like you're saying, earning points, answer trivia, uh, maybe built into that trivia game. We talked about that, the idea of coming up with trivia game. Built into that is some information that may not be, that that would lead you to make a comment or priority. I, this might just be like dumb, but sometimes if there's like the kids play menu on the table, yes. I still play with them. Yes. So what if we did that for adults yes. with like the placemat? We did that. I still we did placemats just to give. Do? Yes, I still do. Yeah. So <laughs> one, one of the things we did for um, Newcastle, and when we, we had a storefront down there, is we developed placemats, like you're saying, and it was all based on historic buildings. But would that also be COVID friendly? Because they don't even keep menus for people. Well, it, that's you're not you take it with you or whatever. So, so the, these placemats were the paper one. We just print them eleven by seventeen. I think yeah. I still have them. And the idea was, this is before your time, <laughs> but the concept was you used to go to a grocery store and get a, a gallon of milk, and there was missing children's pictures, mm -hmm. and it, have you seen this child? And we did it as, have you seen this building? around the historic preservation idea of where where did this building go 
that build preservation sort of it's along this playground. And it was it was a lot of fun because it created that idea of teaching history and interacting. So another way of people rediscovering the historic architecture. Yeah. We used to give digital cameras to everybody, or uh, not digital, the, the Kodak. The little the box Kodak cameras Kodak. that are reusable. And everybody would go out and take have the, take pictures of the worst place you would where you'd never take a visitor, where you would, what you like, and then we would compile those. We print, we'd get them all printed, and then we'd compile them in the in the workshop. People could write stuff next to the phone. Yeah. And sometimes they got nasty because they thought like, that's my property. <laughs> well, it was interesting. Sometimes you'd have things appearing on both lists. Right. The worst place and the best place they would. People had different opinions. And always time. people who take pictures of the thing. <laughs> okay. Old technology, but that's weird. So, like what I hear is this is great. Yeah. Part of this is, is uh, you know, how to make a topic of interest for people to comment on. And, and so we've been talking about this as part of this whole sort of mapping, how to get people interested. What is the question? What could we what could be asked that would build your interest to respond? And and I I, I kind of would like to keep on this theme of comment like the trivia idea that you ask them a question and to see it and then you, you see if you can take them into another le level where they're actually responding or giving some input. Other thoughts? I feel like just to add a little bit on that, like we want the residents to know and understand that it's important, like their, their feedback and what they have to say. And I don't know how we can promote the importance of the feedback, but I think if they knew that, they would respond more and more honestly. Well, and I think too, like if you're going to reach people our age, like Instagram, but if you're going to reach people like 30 and over, like Facebook is their main one. So if you make one of each, I mean, you can share to both. And, you know, especially if you see that from someone, if they share something else, you get a lot. That would help inform you, I think. I'll take like, I mean, I use Instagram probably a lot, but like, you know, if I just go, if I click on the story and it's cool, even if it's minor, like, I think I'm already not that interested. Like, so oh, fun. what's your favorite? Yeah, I click like, them to see what the statistics are. Me too. Are. I like, you know, I yeah. just click it on it. Like, I don't really think much about it. Like, oh, what's your favorite chicken? Uh, I don't you know, click one. Yeah. You know, I don't really care too much about chicken, but like, right. I'll, but I'll, I'll put my it. opinion because it's so yeah. quick and it's interesting for me because I get to see like, oh, I was actually in the lower percentage or whatever, mm -hmm. you know? So I feel like just implementing simple polls yes. is a very good way to get it. I think the best one that I've seen lately was after the, the debate the other night, there was like a before, like who's better and more, you know, like an after. Did it yeah. change your mind? And I thought that it was just like interesting to see. Also, like knowing what we're going to do with the information that they give us, yeah. how we'll use that. And like, because I would not give my input if I thought they weren't going to use it. It's it's weird because like if there was like I, if there was a, like a story on Instagram, I was like, what's your favorite kind of chicken? Just type it out. I would. I'm not gonna put that much effort to it. But if I just simply click Popeyes or like, you know, it's so much easier, you know. Yeah, I don't like shortage ones. I don't yeah. do them. So what kinds of questions based upon what you've been doing? What kinds of questions along this line do you think you could begin to generate? Either a topic or actual an actual question. What would what would lead to be a leading idea? Yeah. So I mean I can think of a dozen. I mean I'm looking at all this stuff you've done. There's a ton of things in here that I think could be really intriguing. But I I want to give you mine. I want to hear what you're thinking. Come on. I think uh, one of the things that I'm 
something that I, I kind of come across as like, interesting. I mean, I guess it's not that interesting. Uh, uh, talking about like the makeup of your communities, like actually getting down into this, some of the, the facts, mm -hmm. and, like the demographic information, the types of people you see, uh, what makes your community what it is, and, and then kind of, and then maybe. Uh, talking about some of the diversity that's missing there, uh, or, uh, which groups or things that aren't um, represented uh, in the communities that are there, like you know, um, racist awareness, um, equity, and possibility. So, so there's questions like, what you know, what do you think the demographic range? You know, what is the percentage in those three things that you, you just quick kind of thing? Honestly, it's something kind of fun to do with that. It's like, it's just like you know, the top, like the, the top filters or whatever. Like, what's the demographic makeup of your county? What other county? And then, like, fill, like, there's like sliders, and the slide you can hand like a pie graph or something like that. It'd be really cool. It's very game of house. Yeah. 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 I mean, are you just familiar with the community profiles directly on our test based on zip code? Mm -hmm. And what it's called this. I present in 261 four days ago. But uh, ESRI has, you click on a zip code, it tells you, it gives you the demographic profile of that zip code. Who lives there, their average age, all that. And it puts it around to a really fun kind of name. Where I live in the West End, it's called Hearts Gravel and something like that. It's really, it's, yeah, you click on 4704, it's an entirely different name. But yeah, that's, um, I think something we often neglect is talking about environmental issues and then how you affect the environment. So questions like understanding how much pollution you emit every year and how you can improve it through walking or where you live, you live in the downtown, walk where you need to go, you know what I mean. In your personal environment. And that could help people understand those. And then also showing them ways to improve it because people have no clue. So I showed my 605 an infographic that shows how much water is used to produce chicken, pork, beef, mm -hmm. and you wouldn't believe how much water is involved just in the production of beef. That, that in itself is a type of infographic or a type of, of input that tells can tell a person that their environmental impact. Yeah. I remember my I remember, um, for a while I was well, I've done that in car in file one hundred, which nobody ever remembers, but carbon footprint is is there were usually you I had to do three different carbon footprints and yeah. to do this. Hard Scrabble Road. I live in Hard Scrabble Road. Yes. Yeah. So 47303 is called Dorm to the Coleman. 47305 is Hard Scrabble Road. 47304 is called Midlife Constants. 
So yeah, it's called tapestry. And it gives you all the demographic data you want. Now, this data is dependent on what? A good census. Not a bad census, but a good census. Okay. So what about questions? Can you think of some questions to write some down to the questions of the question board? For me? Right now, just general, just either from a trivia perspective or just as this idea. What is what? What have you been looking at? What questions could you ask based on that? That might be lead allow you to lead to a conversation or more information. I think I've been given a lot of experience. I think because especially with the things that can happen a lot, the outline is going to have to be smooth and then with the smooth established, I mean like that what people need is thinking and getting done and showing the skills they can. Okay, then well, I want to keep us framed in the comp plan. Then that's a great topic. What does it mean in the comp plan? Um, I guess you then look around and ask how you support. Um, what, what do we need to do to keep the group thing? Well, I think I think broadening the question is what to do when blank shuts down due to blank. That's that's more general, and I think more um, more open to COVID situations or economic situations, you know, sudden change situations. So yeah, the uncertainty of things. You could broaden the question and we can start to address people's concerns because if you can get them talking about something like that. We can bring them in and start to really learn a lot about this stuff. So it could very well be the concern that they're facing right now is how do I get my kids on my, my school age child educated in this time of this conference when I when I've been laid off from my waitressing job or I've been laid off from my those types of things. What to do when blank shuts down due to blank? And that could be flooding, that could be economic, that could be COVID, whatever those things that cause that to be shut down abruptly. You can you can definitely start to get some community input quickly because they will all have a story to play with that. Everyone has one story to play with that. Yeah. Uh, I once again I just kind of have a topic, so I can't think of immediate questions right thing as well like that. Um, but I know food insecurity is also something that's big on people's mind. Once again, we're going to do a lot of the school information. The amount of kids that are on free or reduced lunch is incredibly high, um, especially in Huntsville, you know, throughout the Delaware County. It's very, uh, the poverty, you know, the, it's, it's a place that's not free of poverty, that is for sure. Um, and putting food on the table is something that's not easy to do right now. So even if that's just linking them to information about food banks or Food drives and things that people can give if they have excess, and people can get if they're at a deficit. I think it's so important to start educating on the resources that are out there. So, top questions, other views? Nothing? Got, you got nothing after all this work you've been doing? Something interesting that I was talking about, a couple other people did bring up the Mention like a cool business idea and then mention like say where they would want it. And I think it's kind of interesting to see people who don't really understand lunch and where they think a successful business would be where they would choose to put it. Sorry, I don't know if it relates back to like this very well, but I just think it's Okay, well let's let's take that. So one of the things that is important to 
we need to analyze is business saturation, right? So one of the things that's been very, looking at say the Muncie Mall and retail, the thing that Muncie has is a, a overabundance of retail for the population and buying power. So those are the kind of pieces of information that would really be important to try to get people to understand restaurants, you, you know, number of franchises, the uh, for pop, but those kind of things that are are important to start framing why must be struggling in some of these areas and why we have all this vacant land along all of our corridors because businesses have have been there closed and we build a new one out in the cornfield somewhere and we keep the idea of sprawl. So one of the things I really think we need to get across is the cost of sprawl. That would be a very important thing. And then the opportunities that we have for reuse, redevelopment. So questions around the idea of, you know, how, it, it could be general things. What is the largest land users? Is it housing? Is it industry? What do you think? Things like brownfield. I mean, what are questions that we could begin to ask around? That? You've all done some things here. I would think you could, there's at least a, one or two questions from sort of every map of things you generate. Why did retail die? Online shopping. Quarantine really. Quarantine. What else? Walmart. Uh, Chinese big box stores. Big box. Yes, big box. Right. Places like TJ Maxx. Places like TJ Maxx. So places like TJ Maxx and and big lots are what they do is they buy overstock stuff and they market down. It's not a very popular thing, but. But that has changed that changes the retail power. Right? Well, the question is, did retail die or did retail shift? So part of the part of that understanding is how has the retail uh, diminished to a certain extent, or is it shifting its how it's being you know purchased? You also did not have stable wage right? You had very low wages, very low benefits. So those were, those were not jobs that were folks could invest a career into. It was something, a retail job was always attached to something else. Okay, so with that constant turnover, you don't have the same investment of time, energy, health care benefits that you do. Even when you visit other countries, you, you meet people who, if you need a waiter, and that waiter has been a waiter for 40 years. But that's what they do, you know, waiter. And that there's jobs in our business are not tied together. In the United States, we just tie all the stuff together, right? You're, you're a plant, you're a park, you're, you're a sanitation industry, okay? Right? So those things come together. In Europe and other countries, you're the ghetto. And you have to be away. And it's, these, these things are tied up together so tightly. That we created a little bit of shame behind lower wage jobs. If we can, if we can counter that with something, right, to, to attribute some more meaning to things, those we can understand too, too why retail is experiencing what it's experiencing now. It's more, the, the point there is not to be a flat off, it's to realize that there's more than one reason why retail is suffering the way it's suffering right now. And it's all the things you just, you just got. Yeah, and, and again, putting to, how does that impact the comprehensive plan? That's what we have to keep coming back to. So we're trying to establish a framework for the next 20 to 25 years for Muncie, right? The Delaware County. So the questions we have to raise is not necessarily provide answers, but frame questions and information to create the dialogue and discussion to help people make good decisions or reach a consensus. Um, I have the proposed projects on the 
here. So I'm trying to think about a question we can pick up from that. Because it mentions like roadways, sidewalks, they want to put in things like that from, I believe it's, I think it's 2018 or 2045. So somehow we could come up with a question just so people know. Well, yeah. So what one of the question was how much did we spend on bridge repairs in the last let's take that to take that document. It's a five year document. Was it ten? Do you remember what there's there are two different ones. One's okay. like twenty six and the other is ten or so. Yeah, I think that where's it? So, but I guess the question I'm saying is whichever, I don't care which one it is, I was just probably, what, do people even know that we're repairing bridges or it's part of our plan? Yeah, so how can, those are the kind of questions can we frame out of this? Uh, well, let's start from the top. This slide got me thinking about the topic we haven't like, really focused on, but with climate change and everything going on, Scientists have made like predictions for all areas and what it's going to look like in 20 years. So could we somehow incorporate that again? Because I mean, if we're going to be getting 100 year storms every 25 years, that's something that we probably have to plan for. Getting what storms? Well, but that's an important issue, right? We've discussed this because we have a perception we have plenty of water, but if you look at our aquifer aquifers and how much they're depleted and being polluted, that resource is we're losing it. So, I mean, we have we were up in Bremen doing a thing, and the aquifers up there had arsenic in because of, of farm fields leaching stuff into these aquifers that were taking this water and now became, they had, they had a, the whole west side of Bremen had a whole big cancer run. The west side of where? Bremen. Where's that? It's up in, uh, uh, near Elkhart County, St. Joe County. So, I mean, I, I think those are the kind of things that we need to both say, we have this idea, but we also have, have, have to understand we have to protect them. So that's why understanding where our water source is, the reservoir, where our, you know, where if we're drawing if it wells, those are the kind of questions we're saying. Where does Muncie get its water? What what is what is the what's our, if that's important to us? How do we protect them? So those are big land use decisions, especially within that. That's why that watershed information that shows where things are flowing into those areas is so critical for us. To try to explain through that process. You know, you have a reservoir in Anderson, they're trying to flood out this whole area to do that, which has huge environmental mistakes. But yeah. yet it's still politically popular with the mayor and unfortunately one of our we grants. Can't, can't support it. There's still political will to build a lake. Maybe totally kill it. <laughs> yeah. The Mounds Lake proposal is still very much a There's multiple things that you crew on. I don't remember I 69, they're going at that point. It has to be close though. Um, part of 32 does have to be recrossed because there's a low point right next to the Anderson Airport where, where 32 goes right by it. That would be wrong. You basically lose the airport. Anyway. We won't worry about Anderson, yeah. uh, but back to this idea of how to get the. So again, what are those questions that could lead into that discussion? That's what we need to think through. I would think you all would have a dozen questions from the stuff you've done that you could come up with. Is this questions we're trying to ask the public to get feedback? Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, questions that to stimulate interest or 
it could be a, a trivia question that leads them into data or information. Where does Muncie get, you know, where is, what's what Muncie's primary water source? And you could uh, click that. And then you could have some data or information thing that, that says here's where it is or whatever. So yeah, so so there obviously there. Where's what is Muncie's primary water source? You could say you could ask White River, reservoir, aquifers, and then ask them to you know identify that, and then give an answer that says here's where the percentage from this and that. So, and to the county folks, what's going to be critical there? Where do they get their water? For the county folks to get the water. The ground. Sure, that's called aquifers, right? So the aquifers that are in Delaware County are feeding the county in terms of how far do you, does the typical person in Delaware County have to go down for a well? I yeah, don't I, don't, I don't know. So I mean, one, one, question, one question that our, one of our alums in Fort Wayne asks all town communities, how far, he doesn't ask how, where you get a gallon of milk. You can get a gallon of milk at any gas station. But how far do you have to go to the toilet? Now everybody knows about toilet paper now because it's COVID. <laughs> but rural communities are now having to travel upwards of 25 to 50 miles to the toilet just because the decline of small town retail or the consolidation of small town retail around regional big box stores in around Dollar General has made that trip longer and longer and longer. Yes. But isn't Dollar General getting into every like rural town? Yes. Tra yes. Because all of the towns in my yeah. town yeah. have yes. Dollar General. Yeah. And that has was unheard of well. before. Yeah, that was unheard of yeah. before though. Right. right. But there was, there was with the rise of Walmart, and the decline of the locally owned grocery store. Rural communities had to make, we had to make a trip. We had to make a special trip. And we got to get these supplies to get us through this month. Or you pay $12 to a stick full right. at exactly. exactly. Yeah. So when I was growing up in mid Michigan, we would have a list of things that we would shop for. We'd go to Saginaw. We'd go into Saginaw. Saginaw is 56,000 people, smaller than Munster. But we had a list of things like, well, we'll, we'll do that when we go to SAC. We'll look for this when we go to SAC. And you, you plan your month around things you can buy locally, things you can buy region. So can you start to generate some of those kind of questions that they might lead into some of the sort of reverse engineer the data you've got? And got to a question that would bring someone to begin to ask to be curious or create a trivia question or something that would help lead them into that. Can you do can you all think of some of that? Maybe if you've got a map or something up, you could put a put some questions up. We got some post-it notes, probably we could do that with those around there, something like that. Yeah. Responses. It's at 3 p.m., 3.30. Yeah, it's the, the it's the 3 o'clock yeah. slot. Time. All right, go get a, your lattes and stuff and pretzels. And I'm going to end the meeting. Thank you. I'm going to end the meeting. He didn't respond.